So I just finished Ghost Rider Travels on the Healing Road by Neil Peart. So he was the drummer of Rush and this is quite the long book. It's 460 pages and it consists of basically a big part of it is a travel log. Another big part of it is his reflections on the loss of his daughter and common-law wife within a year. And then a lot of it was letters to other people. And the letters were mostly written to his best friend who was a drug dealer and in prison for most of the letters, which I found surprising. As you may or may not know, I'm doing a whole bunch of drummers books. And I've previously read um, Kenny Aronoff, Liberty DeVito, Fleet, uh, Mick Fleetwood, um, most recently Ed Shaughnessy of the Johnny Carson Tonight Show Band, and um, what else did I read? A few other ones. You can look through my live segment on my channel and check them out. This book, though, is not really about drums or his musical career. It's more about the reflecting on his life after the double loss and it's surprising in a lot of ways um, he mentions Keith Moon being one of his drum heroes and how Keith Moon was on drugs and total hot mess and of course died young and uh, he he says basically how it's funny how the people that you consider to be your heroes can be so screwed up and that's the same thing I get out of this book he is pretty messed up and it, it wasn't all because of the losses of his family members. He was screwed up to begin with in a lot of ways. So I've taken some notes as I went through this book. I usually don't do that. They're mostly notes of things that kind of surprised me a little bit. And I'm not going to tell you this stuff in a judgmental sense, just in informational sense. So one of the things that really struck me, if you listen to subdivisions, a lot of people understand um, that people that are maybe not considered cool have a lot of good feelings towards Neil Peart's writing and himself because they feel like they're represented, uh, represented by him. But yet he fat shames people repeatedly in this book. And it was really, it became really intense. He called them scum, human waste, pigs, cows. And he mentioned at one point people in Las Vegas, he couldn't stand touristy people. He talked about Zion being not far from there and how those people are physically fit. And the people in Vegas are just a bunch of wasteless, uh, wastes of bodies, basically. He said, and this was really really shocking because he said he wanted to take a machine gun and mow them all down and I thought wow that's really terrible because it actually happened in Las Vegas and made me sad for him and the state of the world in addition it became very clear that he was a drunk um, every every time he sat down it was drinking this heavy booze he is a smoker stopped all the time smoked cigarettes but that shocked me as being a athletic person and a drummer that he smoked and he alluded to drugs too several times he didn't straight out say he was on them but he did say something to the effect of his best friend Brutus who was the drug dealer had gotten him some non-prescription items and things like that um, he also mentioned the traveling across states being pulled over how he used a lot of fake names and you can attribute that to being a rock star or you can attribute that to perhaps trying to keep himself out of trouble of being affiliated with his drug dealer friend I'm not sure but it was a little suspicious um, so now I'm gonna switch gears here because my notes were kind of random thoughts that I threw in as I went one thing that was ironic towards the second half of the book he said something about having scum on the surface of his brain and he ended up dying of brain cancer highly aggressive brain cancer and in that segment he mentioned his brain multiple times and that was really 
kind of a weird omen. Um, he wrote this book, released it somewhere around 2000, died in 2020, so that was kind of weird. The other thing he said was that he was spending his money faster than he could make uh, money off of his investments. And he said that he was, his plan was just to spend his money and then die. I thought that was kind of shocking too. Um, the other thing I thought at the very beginning, you can affiliate this with his grief journey, or perhaps maybe not, maybe he just wasn't that smart. But he stopped at a gas station and allowed somebody to fill up his expensive BMW motorcycle with diesel gas, which basically almost ruined the motorcycle. And they had to do extensive rework on that bike to get it to function. Then he took it up to a segment of Alaska that was covered in mud and he's riding by himself and he dumped the bike and almost got basically trapped by the bike. And I'm thinking, man, this guy's not smart. You don't go on a trip like this by yourself. Now, albeit a grief journey, maybe people aren't thinking that way. They just want to go somewhere. So you got to give them a pass, I suppose. Um, the other thing is that he railed about best westerns, which I couldn't understand. I think those are really nice hotels for the most part. And it was clear that he liked bougie places. He talked about fancy food all the time. It was clear he liked to spend his money. Um, the other thing I thought was interesting was that, you know, he's in the Ghost of a Chance song. Um, he, he says that, uh, I feel there's a ghost of a chance you could find someone to love and make it last. His wife, that everyone hears, hears about him losing, was not actually his wife. They were common law, and 22 or 23 years they were together, but never actually married. And a lot of the things that you expect him to be, like an environmentalist and um, compassionate, uh, you know, person in general he was at a bar in I think it was Mexico this woman was having a bad day she said she's gonna go outside kick all the dogs he said I'll come with you and I'll kick all the cats and I thought man animal lovers there would be repulsed about that I know I was there was a lot more statements about shooting people in there um, I already said about spending twice the money he had let's see he claims in another book that he's a linear thinking agnostic so agnostics cannot say whether or not there is God they won't he, and a lot of people think he's he was an atheist but he claims to be an agnostic but then he drove up on a, a church area in a town and he made it quite clear that he had no interest in speaking to any of those people he had a very strong aversion to anyone of religious faith or belief. But yet later in his book, he says that he went to a tarot card reader because he's open to possibilities. And I thought that was quite ridiculous because the guy would have nothing to do with listening to anyone talk about God or faith. Um, and in general, it's, it seems that he only had faith in himself and people. Um, back to the drinking, the one night he said he had two whiskeys and a wine at dinner, which is pretty heavy drinking. And let's see what else I got here. The other part that was weird is that I know this is supposed to be just a grief journey, but he says in there that he intended to write the book towards the very end. And I thought that was interesting because all of these letters to his best friend, he clearly kept them. And I'm thinking, who writes these lengthy le letters to their friends and then keeps them for no reason? And then they end up being published in a book. So it seemed like he definitely had a motive to write in a book. And he was compiling it. And if that isn't the case, then he really, really, really liked to hear himself talk and look at his words and things of that nature and then when he met finally his second wife and I don't know if he actually married her he claims to have married her in the book 
but I don't know if that was just a ceremony or another common law marriage, that he had found his salvation in her and that he once again had a meaning in life and that he had redemption. The, th the problem with that though is 20 years later he's gone and anyone of faith can tell you that if you base your existence on another person it's not going to work because eventually yourself or the other person is going to go and then of course eventually we're all going to go and that in, is the biggest problem I have with him in general and in this book. I had just finished the Ed Shaughnessy book and I got such a feeling of joy reading that man's book and felt like this guy is really a good person. I did not get that feeling from Neil and I'm a lifelong drummer. I really have loved Neil's work since I was a kid and still do. And I've found since 2020 till now, 2024, I've had a very difficult time even thinking about playing Rush music on my drums or listening to very much of it. And the thought of a Rush reunion to me is basically like, just don't do it, okay? But what's good about this experience for me is after reading this, and determining that Neil was pretty messed up, I can kind of f see him more as a person now than a, um, I don't want to use the word idol because that's not proper, but as someone I really looked up to. Of all of the drummer's books I've read so far, and I think I've done six or seven, he's the person that I least enjoyed reading because of his cynicism and just straight up negativity and the fact that he had all of this negativity stemmed from one thing without other people in his life to base his existence and happiness on he had none and he even said such in the book and that right there my friends is why faith is more important than anything else in this life and I don't go on these big long um, religious discussions on my channel. I'm a very um, devoted in prayer and reading to God. And I have a close relationship with Him. I kind of keep it to myself. I'm not an evangelist, nor do I um, try to say that I have all the answers or anything like that. But I have a peace in my life. I've been alone and God never left me and there's people that look up to Neil and read this book and think that that is the normal way to do things is to base your life basically on um, a mirage because eventually people go or you go and in that event you have to have more than that. So I hope that you can take that to heart. Yeah, that's about it.